Welcome to this Weekend Drive edition of Daily Drive for the third week in May 2024. I'm Jamie Butters, Executive Editor of Automotive News in Detroit. And I'm Kellen Walker in Las Vegas. Today we're breaking down some of the biggest stories in the auto industry from the past week and looking forward to what's in store in the days ahead. Today on the show, could we see a future in which all cars are made in China? Dunn Insights CEO Michael Dunn joins us in a few minutes. But first, Jamie, how you doing? Good, Kel. Good to see you. Awesome. Let's get into some news. So this week, we had a series of interviews about the use of AI in the auto industry. What were some of your biggest takeaways, and how do you see AI accelerating the future of the auto industry? Yeah, I'm really fascinated by this because it seems like it's one of those technologies that kind of starts slow and is going to really grow in the way it's implemented, uh, kind of not unlike, you know, maybe the Internet or cell phones. You know, right now we're seeing a lot of people using it for some sort of routine administrative stuff like a like an office intern or something. Uh, but we're starting to see more and more opportunities and, and it's just going to grow over time where it's doing really core uh, industry work. Uh, some of that, as we heard from Marianne Johnson, is about uh, the cost of computing really coming down and freeing up a lot of capability to do computer work. We've also heard from executives, you know, who are using it for the routine stuff, but they can see a future where, you know, it can uh, formulate new ideas and then run them through simulated tests and maybe solve some scientific uh uh, problems for companies without having all the expense and time that would normally go into such a thing. It's a great tool as long as you know how to use it correctly, right? For sure. Also, uh, we talked a lot this week about Ford and their EV troubles. Now, Ford has lost so much on EVs, and we know it's hard for everyone to make money on EVs, but why has Ford taken such a big hit? You know, it's a... Uh, <clears throat> Transparency is a great thing for those of us on the outside, uh, but it it can cost you. And what Ford, part of the reason Ford gets more uh, grief over their EV losses is because they're the only ones who disclose it. Uh, <laughs> General Motors, <laughs> Toyota, you know, they don't talk at Volkswagen. They don't say how much they make or lose on EVs. They just kind of lump it all together and we know that EV sales tend to be costly or the investments in EV, you know, product development and factories and all that, you know, the only really uh, other clear view you have into EV operations is with the startups. And I guess, you know, the, the one company that lost more that we know of lo losing more on EVs in the first quarter was Rivian lost $1.45 billion and GM or Ford lost 1.35. Uh, but that's, that's rough. You know, both of these, units you know ford's model e rivian as a company right they're still small they're still doing a lot of investing you're paying for a lot of things that aren't yet bringing in revenue uh much like you know tesla's first decade or so uh but it really does you know sting ford in the eyes of you know wall street when they they see the money they can make on ford pro the money they can make on the f-150s and then it looks like they're just giving it all away on the EVs. Gotcha. Well, and some great news, not good news, but great <laughs> news, Jamie. Uh, Automotive News has won Magazine of the Year by the American Society of Business Publication Editors. What are your thoughts on winning such a huge honor? You know, I, I'm not a big fan of awards. I worry that they can be a distraction to newsrooms, but, uh, you know, hey, it's really great. Uh, the it's great for our team and it's great for our, you know, our marketing partners on the, the business side of automotive news and crane communications. Um, you know, what's, what's kind of amazing is, you know, we, no, no, none of the crane publications had ever won magazine of the year and we've now won it two of the past three years. So that's pretty cool. And it also really stands out to me, you know, we've, shifted our business very much uh, in a digital way. We're very digital first. We have our social media campaign from the newsroom also won awards from the Neil Awards and these ASBI Awards. Uh, but the fact that our, our printed product that we know a lot of our audience really values a lot of people, whether they work at dealerships or they work at the automakers or the service companies, they really love having it in print. 
Uh, they like having, you know, the final assembly page at the back. They like having a front page that shows what our priorities are. Um, and so they, they really enjoy that and appreciate it. And, and it's a real honor uh, for the whole team here to have these other editors from around the country say that we're the best. Congratulations to the whole team from the top down. Huge win uh, coming up. Chinese auto industry expert Michael Dunn joins us to talk about the recent piece he wrote about why he thinks all cars could someday be made in China. That's next on Weekend Drive. Welcome back to Weekend Drive. I'm Jamie Butters with Kellen Walker. Imagine a world in which China builds every car. Unthinkable, right? Think again. That's the opening of Michael Dunn's May 7th column in his Dunn Insights newsletter, titled, When Every Car is Made in China, Bracing for the Ultimate Global Automotive Disruption. Dunn is the founder of Dunn Insights and a longtime expert on the auto industry in China. He joins me now to talk about it. Michael Dunn, welcome to Weekend Drive. Jamie, thank you for having me. Been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, not, not more than I have. I, look, anyone who knows anything or wants to know anything about the auto industry in China reads your work or listens to you speak whenever they can. But you really got my attention with your recent piece about the risk that China takes over global production of automobiles as it has so many other consumer goods. Mike, what's going on? It's real, Jamie. I mean, look at solar panels to shipping to steel. And China's come to dominate global supply and solar panels, 95% of solar panels built and sold globally are built in China. So could it be, could we see a future where all automotive vehicles are built in China? This is kind of, this is kind of uh, unbelievable. It's not. Yeah. I mean, so my first thought is, okay, you know, America has never defined its industrial might by how many solar panels it made, right? right? But the auto industry has been really central for about a century. Um, and so it's, it's a maybe more complicated, maybe a trickier market to corner, uh, but they seem to be really kind of moving toward that. Absolutely. So I think about it in terms of Sputnik, remember that satellite that the Soviets put in to space, 1957, I think, was the year. And it was a shock to the United States government, to the people of America. Oh, my goodness, they're ahead. They're bigger, badder, and more powerful. And what do we have in our garage? Nothing. That's <laughs> what we should be preparing for coming out of China. Look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. China last year built 30 million vehicles, US 10 million. China leads the world in exports today surpassing Japan last year. This year, they'll export 6 million cars to more than 100 markets around the world. Up and down the list, electric vehicles, China builds more EVs than the rest of the world combined. Never in the history, that was 100 years you've talked about, Jamie, have we confronted something like this, this monstrous, powerful machine called China Automotive. Now, why not? Why aren't we waking up to this this threat? One of the things going on is that the Detroit Three continue to make tremendous profits at home, selling large SUVs and trucks and saying, hey, we're doing everything exactly right. What's to be worried about? <laughs> you know, I can remember I've been, you know, uh, I've been around this industry for a long time. Uh, already. And, you know, I can remember covering China when it was 3 million sales a year, and then it grew to 30 million. Uh, of course, since then, it's kind of dialed back, which is why we have all these vehicles being exported, <laughs> because there's no one to buy them at home. And I remember for so many years, um, <clears throat> automakers would just say, uh, Chinese automakers and their you know global JV partners say, oh, we're just investing here to serve this vast potential market that is just untapped and when the chinese consumer you know can buy cars they will and we're we're just going to sell to them but we really shouldn't be surprised that now the, the everyone's exporting from uh, from out of china it was so good for so long jamie you're right many executives there would call it you know an automatic profit center. China was for years a creator of billions of dollars of profits for global automakers. That's no longer the case. 
their market shares have fallen, profits are going away fast, even the Chinese manufacturer under pressure, price wars, overcapacity at home, enormous pressure cooker to find markets globally. And there's no more delicious prospect than to crack the US market. I mean, they've gone everywhere else. I was just in Mexico earlier this week. Jamie, I saw more than 20 Chinese brands are for sale there today. Wow. So they're on we the move globally. Yeah, I mean the U.S. is still the prize, right? China sells twice as many vehicles. As, you know, Chinese people and companies, you know, buy twice as many vehicles as Americans do, but America spends more money. <laughs> like it is still a bigger revenue source uh, here in the U.S. Absolutely, the profits are here, not at home, and so for Detroit, the challenge is oh. I should add that this is not just the Chinese automakers who are exporting globally, but importantly, global automakers are increasingly finding China to be the place for manufacturing for export globally. Tesla, half of their global production centered in China. They exported last year 350,000 cars from China. GM mm -hmm. now exports a huge number of Chevys from China to Mexico. In fact, they're the number one supplier of vehicles to the Mexican market. So not only are we having to contend with the competition from the Chinese brands like BYD, but from ourselves, uh, <laughs> we better get ahead of this thing. Like, wait a second, we found the enemy and wait, what's the expression? And it's us. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, you know, obviously, everybody wants to find uh, the ability to produce at low cost. And I think, you know, for look, the, I think the, for a lot of Americans, they're like as as a consumer, you know, or if I'm an auto dealer looking to add an upstart brand with a cost advantage. Right. It's like it only makes sense to let the Chinese Communist Party and the government it controls pay for half of the cost. But as a matter of policy. Is it's there's still a significant national security issue at play, right? This is kind of like um, computer chips or steel, just really fundamental uh, for the, the future security of the country. Fundamental to our economics, to our national security. And it's different this time, Jamie, from when the Japanese and the Koreans came in, because ultimately those were our allies and they were as economies subordinate to our own for the first time. In China, we have an adversary with bigger guns than we do. And we don't have a lot of leverage when it comes to shaping what they're going to do next. So one must begin to think not just, oh, I could get a cheaper car from China. This is great. But what are the implications if I'm getting all my cars from China? Do we have supply chains at home here anymore? Do we have the wherewithal, of the skills? Do we have the jobs? What if things do get messy and we have to go to war? Where's our industry? Well, at that point, we'd say, how in the world did we get here that we moved all of our production <laughs> to China? What were we thinking? So that, that day is here and now, Jamie. I really feel as though it's time for Detroit to understand it's on with the Chinese and what does it mean? It means we have to begin to think beyond making profits on large trucks at home and becoming globally competitive once more. That's really the goal. Yeah. It, look, I mean, it's, it's not easy, right? Uh, China has a big head start. Uh, we just saw the news uh, recently, uh, uh, President Biden quadrupling the tariffs on uh, EVs made in China. And I don't know, mathematically, I guess that seems reasonable. If we assume half the costs are covered by the government, then we charge back another, you know, try to even it out. But it also really doesn't do anything about the the threat of, a, you know, investments in Mexico or Canada or even here in the U.S. Uh, that would be really compelling to, you know, local governors who would not want to turn away billions of dollars in investment to create thousands of, of good jobs. But those would still be kind of, you know, probably subsidized and unfairly competing, just like uh, the, the cars coming out of China. Mm -hmm. We've already seen illustrations of exactly what you're talking about, Jamie, here in California, where the government, the governor 
is cl closely aligned with the interests, it seems, of the People's Republic of China, best buddies in some ways. So you begin to understand how the Chinese would dismantle the protections that the Biden administration wants to put in place. Let's go to the states. Let's become partners with the states and have the governor endorse us and the dealers in those states endorse us and the customers saying, yes, we want cheaper products. So they would want to divide and conquer the United States. That would be their strategy um, going forward because the 100% duties are substantial. They are probably showstoppers. Next step would be, okay, we're not going to export from China. We'll invest there and they'll begin to pick the right states to do so. Well, even Mexico. I mean, we we have a really close trading relationship with Mexico. We've had a uh, an agreement with Mexico and Canada for more than 25 years, almost coming on 30 years, uh, to have very low tariffs between the countries. It would be really problematic to try to, to break that apart or to put it at risk. Uh, but like you said, you were just down at the BYD truck launch in Mexico. I mean, a $50,000 pickup. It feels like that has to be aimed at the U.S. market, not at Mexico and Brazil. A hundred percent. You got to believe the product's being launched now. It's a very impressive product. I had a chance to test drive it. It's got all the all the specs you'd want from engine power, performance, range. It's a PHEV, quality, fit and finish. It's all there. And you say this product was conceived of probably four or five years ago with the intent of coming here to the United States. Whoops, we have the product. We better find other markets. So Mexico. Yeah, for now. It's, for now. Uh, for yeah. now. You know, um, I, because look, I mean, I've covered, a, a, like you said, a lot of plants, a lot of uh, vehicle reveals. You know, the, the famous thing that the companies will say is, well, we don't have anything to announce at this time. And it's like, okay, like, I know you've decided, you've decided what you're going to do. Like, well, we have nothing to announce at this time. And that's, this it feels time. like that's what BYD is saying, right? We have, we have no plans to come into the U S at this time. Exactly. They've called it uh, confusing. They've called it um, uh, contradictory. Uh, we're not interested. We're really not interested. We're a hundred percent not interested in the meantime, they're building plants in Thailand and Brazil and Hungary and probably in Mexico. They have an ambition to go global and they understand that transplants will be central to that effort. Uh, ideally, one day here for them, ideally here in the United States, but bring us back to your point earlier, the United States government, the United States people have to make some really big decisions. Are we going to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and figure out a way to be, compete globally? and offer our own products to our own consumers at competitive prices? Or are we going to capitulate and say, you know what, they're better than we are. So um, let's try to make the word, the best of a tough situation. And um, it doesn't seem, yeah, it, it's time to make some decisions along those fronts. All right. Well, we'll see what decisions get made and we'll uh, circle back to you about uh, what they all mean. Michael Dunn, uh, CEO of Dunn Insights. Thanks so much for joining me again. Thank you, Jamie. Always a pleasure. That's all for this Weekend Drive edition of Daily Drive. I'm Jamie Butters. And I'm Kellen Walker. Thanks to Automotive News executive producer Jake Neer for his help on today's podcast. You can get the latest news on auto manufacturing in China, artificial intelligence, and everything happening in the auto industry at autonews.com. Come back on Monday for a conversation with Alex Kendall, founder and CEO of self-driving technology company Wave, which just raised a billion dollars from the likes of NVIDIA, SoftBank, and Microsoft for a shot at a self-driving breakthrough. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you think of the show and the topics we covered today. Send us an email at dailydrive at autonews.com or leave us a voicemail at 313-444-2774. If you enjoy the podcast, remember to like, leave a review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode.